Hi. So we've been talking about uh, the Boston Marathon bombings a lot tonight, and they occurred just over a year ago, injured hundreds of people. One of the people that was injured is Adrienne Hazlitt Davis. She's shown here. Adrienne lost her left leg below the knee. Adrienne is a professional dancer. She lives and breathes dancing. So she's shown here with Professor Hugh Herr, director of the Biomechatronics Group. Hugh is also a baloney, bilateral baloney amputee. In the Biomechatronics Group, we try to investigate science and technology to restore the abilities of those who are disabled. So after the attacks, we all wanted to do something. We all wanted to contribute in some way. So we're rehabilitation scientists. So what we, we tried to do was give Adrienne and others like her back her ability to dance. We began by investigating how people move when they dance. So here's a professional dancer that we brought into our gate laboratory at the, uh, by, in the biomechatronics group. And we placed hundreds of little sensors all over her body. And we're tracking the XYZ coordinates of these sensors. We're also looking at how her feet interact with the ground. And using a biomechanical model and Newton's laws, we can find the torque, angle, power at all of her joints. And we're particularly interested in the ankle joint since we're building, Adrian, a bionic dancing prosthesis. So to build a bionic prosthesis, we need two things. We need a piece of hardware, so a robot to control. That's this. So we used a biome. This is a spin-off company that came out of our group. It's a powered ankle prosthesis, and it's the first one of these technologies ever developed. So we need a powered piece of technology here, and we also need a control system. And this device uses motors and springs that act like muscles and tendons. So this was the first device to restore the natural walking gait of below knee amputees. So I was saying we need a control system. So we take that information that we learned from the biomechanical model, and we represent it mathematically, and we can download it. This is a picture of us downloading a control system into a set of computers or sort of brains inside of this bionic device. So this device will respond to Adrian when she dances. So it's not sort of playing a sort of feed forward control program and she's riding it. She's actually interacting with it and responding to it. And we're making titanium and carbon fiber and aluminum behave like flesh and bone. So Adrian spent many, many months working with us. She danced with us and we incorporated her feedback into the control system. This is sort of us testing a sort of spinning control paradigm where we looked at how the body responds when you spin. And so all your weight then goes onto one foot and all of the biomechanics change. So this device has something like intelligence that detects when you're spinning and then it behaves and responds naturally. So Adrian worked with us for about eight months and so then Last month, she demoed this technology for the first time publicly at the TED conference. So I would encourage you to, uh, to look this up. Professor Herr gave a TED talk, and so she danced for the first time. And so I'm gonna conclude this talk by showing you a snippet of this, but what I kind of want this to, what I kind of want to underline for everybody is that there's really a strong power in, in bionics, and that we can put people back to places that we thought that they would never be. So here's Adrienne dancing with her bionic device. All right, I'm, I'm going to be early. I win. That's amazing. Thank you. That, that is truly extraordinary. I, Thank you. I, I'm not quite as amazed as I would have been because, only because Hugh Hare gave a talk for me in oh. my museum a few years, no, no, a few <laughs> years ago. And of course, he walks on early, earlier generation yeah. bionic limbs. And he unless does. he tells you, if he's wearing long pants, mm -hmm. you don't know. I um, mean, he walks in a way which is astonishingly unaffected. Mm -hmm. uh, by the fact that he's using bionic limbs. So we're going to, this is extra time. We can start again now because you, you save time. Yeah. Um, so could you say something about the robotic systems that allow you to, 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 
to create this truly, as it were, animate quality to these limbs. They're so far removed from what most people think of mm -hmm. when they think of a prosthesis. Mm -hmm. What's involved robotically in getting that? So basically, the first thing we do is we try to understand how the human body works. That's where all of these devices started. It's where the devices that Hugh was wearing uh, when you spoke with them. So we try to understand how the human body works, and then we try to replicate it with machines. So, so as I said there's a motor and a spring that replicates muscle and tendon, and there's a lot of uh, sort of robotic ab uh, advantages to that type of architecture. So that's kind of how it works. And then we kind of try to solve all the physics problems associated with that type of implementation. Okay. All right. Please, question here. Thank you. Um, my question is, is, so we've seen the elegant running blades uh, so that you can uh, run fast, mm -hmm. and now we've seen this with dancing. So mm -hmm. do you envision that there might be one limb fits all, so that for, for different types of, uh, of uses? So I think it's only a matter of time before the type of limbs that we're creating, the bionic, bionic limbs, are sort of as good or better than the limbs that we have. So that day is coming. So then there wouldn't be sort of a switching out of these different, there are processes for these different, different modes. So it's only a matter of time before there's no switching because the machinery that we put on is sort of more advanced than our legs. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Over here, please. D could this technology be used to create um, robots that can walk on their own like humans? Definitely. For sure, yeah. So, so there's a, this is a very large uh, area of research called humanoid robotics, and they overlap a lot. So all the techniques that we use are sort of shared by that community. Uh, a good thing to look at would be the DARPA Robotics Challenge robot. So that's a very, very, very powerful humanoid uh, robotics device. And we kind of have an idea in our research group to take these prostheses, these bionic prostheses that we're developing, and create a, a bipedal robot with them. Please, over here. So you're working on external appendages and limbs, and of course tissue engineers are working on making living organs. Do you think maybe there'll be a day when we see a bionic heart? Ah, yeah, definitely. Or at least so a, an interaction or an interplay between biological hearts and sort of bionic hearts. Uh, one of our colleagues, actually at Harvard, has looked at a device that you can, soft robotic device that you can put around the heart and you can sort of apply contractile force to it and help the heart beat. So, so that, that day is approaching very fast, I think. Please. So how do we put controls around technology like this? Because like you said, eventually they'll be better than our own limbs. So for athletes or mm -hmm. you know, the scary situation, soldiers, like what happens when you actually start making people more powerful than they would naturally be? How do we kind of control that situation and put rules around it? Do you mean from a sort of conf controls physics perspective or like an ethical pers perspective? Ethical. I mean like how do you have a football match where your quarterback has a prosthetic arm that's better than a human arm? Yeah, no, that's a fair point. I think what will actually happen is we'll see kind of a divergence between the type of technology that is sort of bionic and when it gets more advanced than, than biological technology, you'll see a divergence. So instead of going to watch the Olympics, the sort of regular Olympics, you'll have the Bionic Olympics, and it'll be instead of, it'll be sort of way more advanced. So I do think that that will happen, but they won't be thought of as together. They'll be as two separate things. You won't see a Bionic athlete competing with a able-bodied athlete once we've established that they're sort of more, more advanced. Okay, please. So do you envision people with these Bionic limbs that have sensors that can accept inputs such as touch, cold, heat, and interface that with a human brain? Yeah, so interfacing these devices with the human brain is kind of the next big kind of step function. There's a lot of people working on this. It's a very complex problem. But it would be not just sort of temperature. I mean, we could imagine sensing everything. So they're trying to provide just a sense of my foot, where the weight is distributed between my feet, called center of pressure. That is an amazing uh, sensation that provides me my ability to balance and walk around on stage. So not having that makes it much more difficult and it increases cognitive burden. So we would probably not just sort of, sort of apply sensations like heat, but we would do the entire force map. Or, I mean, every sensation that you can imagine, you know, that list goes on and on. So very brief question, unfair. How many of the folks who were damaged, had limbs damaged last year, are going to get helped with technologies like this? Do you have any sense? If you mean help with bionic technologies, I hope Lots and lots. We're sort of 
trying to make, we're trying to uh, create the appropriate code language to allow these bionic devices, this one, this biome that you saw, we're trying to create appropriate code language with Center for Medicaid Services to allow it to be uh, sort of reimbursed by all the payers, all the insurance companies. So we're sort of in the process of making this device more widely available. Okay. Thank you very much, Elliot. Thank you.